Hi, this is Dr. Hale and I'm here to present you with information for CUIN 4331, both my Wednesday and Thursday section um, on both promoting young adult literature as well as censorship. So we're going to start with promoting young adult literature. So you guys know, um, I've told you since the beginning of the semester that I am a strong believer in the fact that everyone working with young readers should get into the habit of reading some of the books that are aimed at adolescents. Uh, by doing this, I think all of us can work together to match our students to books. It makes no difference if you're the English teacher, the social studies teacher, the math teacher, the science teacher, the music teacher. We all need to be good models of literacy for our kids uh, and for what they read um, and show them that we value reading. So one of the things, another thing that I also want you guys to walk away from class with is that one of the biggest lessons literacy researchers have taken from all of their studies uh, is that students' reading interests um, increase when they have choice. Choice is a huge motivational factor for our students in terms of reading. Um, this suggests that for us as teachers, we need to provide a variety of books and give readers choices about they, what they read. That's why for your reading list this semester, you've read from a variety of genres, and I've given you choices um, to include in your future classroom libraries, whether you're a science teacher, a social studies teacher, a math teacher, or an English teacher. Um, reading some of the research out there, um, I've read some information about some Arizona State University professors in their Department of Exercise and Wellness, which is also what we call PE, and they began using an acronym for their program, P PLAY, and it stands for Promoting Lifelong Activity for Youth. So one of, the, uh, one of the things about this play program is that they provide for choice. Instead of every student in that PE class doing the same thing at the same time, like we did when I took PE classes, students have choice about the different physical activities in which they engage. Um, and those professors did that because they felt like that was the best way to promote lifelong physical activity for students. So we need to adopt this same philosophy in reading. We want to promote lifelong literacy for youth. So let's think about what else we can learn from these professors. In these new play classes or PE classes, classes they don't play elimination games um, because of what it does to student morale. So we equate this idea with the idea of a spelling bee that we use in literacy. That's an elimination game. Maybe, that, that's, maybe that's not the best use of our students' time. Think about how kids who are not athletic are picked on in PE. I, I was one of those kids. <laughs> so we equate that with the idea of round-robin reading. Round-robin reading, if you're not sure what that means, is when in a, in a class we have children take turns reading aloud from whatever we're all reading together. So think about the kid who's not a strong reader and how they get picked on. The major lesson that we can take from this group though is the importance of choice and you're going to hear me say that a lot. Um, you've already heard me say it a lot all semester. So um, some other research that's out there talks about the idea of free reading. Sometimes it's called uh, independent reading or individualized reading. But free reading um, is one of the things that we can pull from research that's beneficial for our kids. Free reading, it can be a free reading class. Some, some schools offer an elective that's called free reading, or it can be part of a course, like part of an English class, where you have free reading two or three days a week. Um, this is often offered as a way to prevent a drop-off of reading that often occurs uh, when kids are leaving kind of the middle school years and heading into the high school years. In a free reading program, students choose what they want to read, period. The teacher can make suggestions, offer encouragement, but ultimately the students choose. There's, um, you, you want to make sure there's a classroom library available from which kids can choose books. And after students, after each student finishes a book, they hold a conference with the teacher before beginning the next book. Not as um, a test, 
but as a way for the teacher to kind of um, expand their thinking about the book. Um, so when we think about free reading, a couple of professors here from the University of Houston, uh, Dr. Dick Abrahamson, who's now retired, and Dr. Eleanor Tyson, um, wrote an article a number of years ago called What Every Teacher Should Know About Free Reading. And here's what they found. They, they synthesized lots of research studies that had been done about free reading, and they found that free reading is enjoyed by both students and teachers. Um, they found that over the course of a, f a semester, students choose a variety of books. They don't always pick the same kind. They found uh, that the students' reading skills improve. Some of that is probably due to an attitude change, but also the more you read, the better you get. Um, they found that students who are taught through free reading are more likely to read as adults, and in addition, they're more likely um, to read with their children. Um, they found that individual conferences help the literature come alive for students because that's what we do when we read. When we read a good book, we want to talk to somebody about it. They found that those reading conferences help, help to break down barriers that exist between students and teachers, helps them to form relationships, and you guys have seen that um, this semester as you've been reading with your scholars over at A Plus Up. They also found that good teachers employ the concept of reading ladders, and this is a neat concept. Terry Lassane has gone on to write about this um, in her work entitled Reading Ladders, uh, but a reading ladder is something that the, the teacher works with the student on. So let's say you have a conference with a student who has just finished reading a mystery by an author named Jay Bennett. Um, and they talk about how they liked working to solve that mystery. Well, it may be that you suggest some other mysteries that they might read. So if you think about the idea of a ladder, it scaffolds up one step to the next. So when you're um, using reading ladders with kids in an indirect way, or not so indirect, you're pushing them to read books that are more complex each time. So you're you're completely working uh, that uh, zone of proximal development that Vygotsky theorized, and you're helping kids to read more and more complex texts. Another thing that we can do is book talk. Book talking is a great way to get kids interested in books, but when we're getting ready to deliver a book talk, we want to make sure that we're prepared. Um, so you want to make sure you've read the book, or um, that that's a biggie for me. Don't book talk a book that you haven't read, because sometimes you'll end up giving incorrect information. So prepare well. Um, show the books as you talk to the kids. I'm sure you guys have seen the difference this semester. Um, in class, sometimes I bring books in and I put them out on the tables or I hold them when I'm talking about them as opposed to having a, sc a screenshot of it on the slide. It's, it's more engaging when I have the book. Um, if you're going to read an excerpt from the book, make sure you choose that excerpt carefully. Make sure it is one that is, is representative of the tone in the book. When you book talk, when you employ this strategy in any class, make sure that you book talk a wide variety of books so that you're appealing to all the different kids in your classroom. Um, I am currently going through a stage where I'm reading a lot of nonfiction, but if I only ever book talk nonfiction, I'm not going to pique the interest of those kids of mine who are really into graphic novels or fiction. You also want to keep a record of which you, books you've book talked. Um, in my classroom, I liked to do that in a journal, a reading journal that I kept, and I just put it on the um, tray, the marker tray on the whiteboard, and um, if students needed help finding a new book and I was working with another student, they knew that they could just go look at that reading journal, and I usually had the title and the author and a short three or four line synopsis of the book so they could flip through there. So there are some ideas about promoting and using young adult literature, and I want to move on to censorship. So let's think about why people censor books. So the biggest reason is that um, as human beings, it is just human nature to fear things that we don't understand. 
Um, and so what happens with parents or other people is uh, they start to feel uncomfortable with some of the books that are popular with teens. There's a generation gap. There's always going to be a generation gap. And so the older people in the community, and I don't mean the senior citizens, I mean the parents or the teachers or the adults, not the teens, they don't understand those teens. And so they, they have some discomfort over those books that are popular with them. So thinking about how you deal with it, if you ever have a parent who comes to you with complaints about a book or some instructional material that you're using, the first thing you need to make sure you do is listen. It is very easy for us to jump to conclusions and get irritated with the parent, or I keep saying parent, or the person who's wanting to censor a book, but you wanna make sure you listen um, more than then you talk, at least at first. This says more than they talk, but really listen more than you talk at first. Let them get it out. A lot of times they just need to talk about it. Also, make sure you um, are familiar with the resources that are available from the American Library Association. They have been fighting censorship and they've been on record about censorship um, since the 1920s. And they have, um, a publication that you can find on their website called the Intellectual Freedom Manual that will give you lots of information. So when we think about censorship and censors, um, it's important to know that anything we choose to use in our classrooms is potentially censor censorable. Nobody's ever going to like everything we choose. A lot of times, the newer the work, the more likely it is to come under attack. Censorship, it says it's capricious and arbitrary. It can happen anywhere, that's what that means. Once censorship starts, it kind of spreads this ripple of fear, and it does, doesn't always come from people outside the school. Sometimes it can come from people inside the school. Um, it can happen to anyone. Uh, if a school district doesn't have clear board approved policies, they need to. Uh, if a book is ever removed, keep in mind that no book is going to be safe anymore. And educators and parents need to work together to help each other. Censors um, do this for lots of reasons. For sex, they see it as an attack on the country. They call it pacifist. It could be about religion. You can see there's a ton of reasons on this slide why censors do this. So what? What does that matter? Well. What I believe is that school should be a place um, where intellect ferments in the community, where it grows. And it should be one place where students have the freedom to think, to ask questions, to talk about it, uh, to talk about consequences. And because of that, we as educators have to continue to fight that censorship that's out there. So be active, know what's going on, know what your school district's policy is, think carefully when choosing instructional materials, but don't be afraid to choose instructional materials. So thinking about what's coming up, um, you, you wanna review your notes from this lecture, Keep reading with your scholar. They're still looking forward to you coming over. Make sure that during the week of Thanksgiving, you know what their calendar is. They follow the same calendar as HISD, so I don't know for sure if that means they're in school at all the week of Thanksgiving or not, but you wanna check that. Enjoy your Thanksgiving break. Um, you need to make sure you begin reading The Octopus Scientists and Americanized, Americanized and post your original responses by the due dates. Our next class meeting, if you're in the Wednesday class, it's November 28th. Thursday class, November 29th. On that day, you'll have your final exam. I will be posting a discussion guide in the next few days, and you'll also need to turn in a hard copy of your read aloud assignment. If you have any questions, please email or call and leave a message in my office and it'll come to my email. You guys take care.